Okay, thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Um, and I'm hoping um, our 10 is on. Um, so my name is Ed Wright. I'm the secretary of uh, your council uh, this year. And I just wanted to introduce uh, Martin Berge Bergeron. Um, so what can get the pulse rate of an astronomer, either uh, amateur or professional, really racing this year? Well, it could be something like, you know, Elon Musk and uh, Starlink, that could get your pulse rate racing. But the other thing that can get your pulse rating racing is the James Webb Space Telescope, or as it's affectionately known, the Webb. So I wanted to say we are very privileged and I'm ecstatic that we're able to have uh, Martin uh, Bergeron uh, join us from the Canadian Space Agency for a one hour talk on the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and uh, just to introduce uh, Martin, he is the uh, Director of Space Exploration Development at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, his talk is called uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, Canada's role uh, in the exploration of the universe. Uh, and just one last uh, final comment, uh, Martin, I'm very glad that you're able to join us. It's been a journey <laughs> to get Martin here. It actually started back in February of this year. And uh, somebody that I know at the CSA said, oh, we can maybe get a, a speaker. And uh, so it's taken this while and just to get our timetables together. So uh, I think this is really uh, glorious for us to be able to do this. And this is actually the first time that uh, I've been able to see and speak with Martin. So is Why that is it? it? We're still sharing the, that image to the projector. And Martin, we're just trying to get our technology working here. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll be sharing my screen if that's okay. Uh, what's it doing? It's just not. Can I, no can I be sharing my screen? Uh -oh. Okay, there was just a full screen thing going on. Okay, okay. Now just let me switch the audio over. Okay, just hang on a minute. Oh, I'm, I see that I'm. This is the cost we pay for you not having screen. to fly out here. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'd like to share my own screen if it's possible. The presentation. Yeah, for sure. Okay. It's it, it's just that it's disabled. You'll have to enable my screen sharing. So with that, I'll, I'll get it started so we don't wait much while this is being enabled. So bonsoir, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's certainly with great pleasure that I'll be walking us through one of the, the most amazing, at least in my opinion, engineering and scientific accomplishment of our time, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, in doing so, we'll take a look at the instruments. Uh, we'll look also at the science questions, some of the Canadian contributions to the observatory. Uh, finally, I also want to say a few words of the institutions, Canadian Space Agency, namely, and others, and the community responsible not only for the development of web, but also of the Canadian Space Astronomy Program. So I'm all ready to get started, provided that I was unable to share my screen. It looks like it is. Yeah, that's excellent. And hopefully now you will see what I'm trying to share with you. Okay, maybe a bit of delay, but should work. It looks it does. Okay, you all see that? Okay, so uh, since 1990, uh, and can you hear me well? Well enough? That's good? So since 1990, uh, the Canadian Space Agency has had the mandate to promote the peaceful use and development of space. So it's both to advancement of knowledge of space through science and to ensure that space science and technology provides social and economic benefits for Canadians. So we support this mandate in a variety of ways. This includes space utilization, that is the use of satellites for Earth observation and communication, but also the science mission that look, for example, at the Earth atmosphere and at the Earth's surface. Uh, we also work with science and technology to develop and foster the growth and capability of the Canadian space sector, both in academia and also in the industry and also to inspire this, the next generation to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So our main program elements include, and you'll see some of them now, the International Space Station, which is poised to be extended all the way to 2024 and hopefully further. Also the RadarSat Constellation mission, uh, which is an all-weather ice monitoring of Canada's waters, also used for disaster management, environmental monitoring, security, sovereignty, et cetera, to name a few. 
More recently, and also right on the topic of the previous speaker, is our Lunar Gateway uh, Orbital Platform, or, or Gateway, whose contribution will uh, enable us to have a Canadian sea and go all the way into orbit to the moon in the near future. So. Last but least, and it's the Space Exploration Program, which includes our Canadian Astronaut Program, but also planetary science, planetary exploration, and what is the topic of today? It's space astronomy. So the CSA, of course, is not alone in defining the priorities and delivering on the Space Astronomy Program. We're supported by the what we call a Joint Committee on Space Astronomy, which is in, done in partnership with the Canadian Astronomical Society, or CASCA. We're also coordinating our effort with the National Research Council, in particular, the Erzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center, located in Victoria, which is well known, and whose role is to coordinate the Canadian, the Canadian ground-based astronomy program. They also operate the Canadian Astronomy Data Center, perhaps some of you have used it before, which serve as a national archive for astronomical data, whether they're ground-based or space-based. Most importantly for us, the CSA is implementing its space astronomy program following the recommendations from the community. Uh, one such key driver uh, is the CASCA Long Range Report, which they deliver every 10 years, which we support in its development. The latest that was issued was in 2020, and it covers the next decade all the way to 2030s. It provides the community viewpoint on the rationale and the primary science questions that should be targeted and so, and also make recommendations to the priority observatory that Canada could contribute to in the next decade. We see some of the key science questions, for example, how did the universe begin? How stars have evolved? What are the extreme conditions of the universe? And what are the planetary systems uh, that could host, for example, life? Those questions you'll see are very aligned to the goals and objective of James Webb itself. So obviously the James Webb has drawn a lot of attention since the beginning uh, and, and, and it was already identified early as an important contribution to the many questions that I've just mentioned. So we'll take a closer look at that. So what is James Webb? I think it's well known from uh, many people, but I'd like to refer to it as our flagship. Of course, we don't, we don't uh, manage and own the spacecraft, but it's the flagship space astronomy uh, component of, of, our, uh, of our fleet. So it's an international collaboration between, of course, NASA, but also the European Space Agency, and perhaps not as well known even for Canadians as there's a significant Canadian contribution. For us, it's a mission of unprecedented size and complexity in space astronomy. It is the largest single investment that Canada has made in the space instrument, costing well beyond $200 million to develop the key instruments, but also to contribute to the operation which we do, and to reap the benefit of the amazing science that we have been for. So just a few key elements. So it's a massive 18 hexagonal segment, 6.5 meter primary mirror. Uh, Webb has an impressive one milliarc second pointing accuracy covering a wavelength range for those that understand the numbers from 0. 0.6 to 28.5 microns. Uh, it was launched successfully on Christmas day from Europe spaceport located in Kourou in French Guiana. And uh, hopefully you've seen the launch, a very, very great picture, and even more impressive was the deployment soon after. Uh, Webb has since arrived at its final destination. We'll take a look at this. And it has started operating, of course, as uh, July of this year uh, with uh, the amazing early release observations. We'll take a look at some of those later on. I think it's time to acknowledge some of the key players, uh, principal investigator, Dr. René Doyon from University of Montréal, the project scientist, Dr. Chris Willett, at NRC and the mission scientist, which is a resident at CSA Jean Dupuis. So I think it's it's not fair to say James Webb came out of a vacuum. It builds on the shoulder of many previous successes, both internationally and also in Canada. So it's important not to construe that Canada contributed to Hubble shown here, but but Hubble successful launch in uh, in 1990 uh, aboard the space shuttle. Uh, yeah.
Hopefully, I don't know if it's me that got uh, kicked out or if I kicked out my apologies to everyone. Let's go back to uh, please enable sharing again, and I'll be continuing with HST. My apologies for the technical difficulties. Let me know when uh, I'll be able to share again next time. It's not yet enabled. I still can't share the screen. It's okay. Uh, James Webb wasn't built in a day two, so they've got their shares of problems. <laughs> okay, we got it again. Okay, let's 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 get, let's get to continue. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so as I was saying, obviously, as it builds on the previous success of Webb. Uh, no, even even lessons learned. Uh, no, Hubble had significant cost of a run, but it was also a warning that space missions designed they must be carefully planned and tightly controlled. So Hubble is very different from James Webb. It's, it's quite different. The NASA does not operate in the same wavelength domain. Uh, Webb is more the six time the, the light gathering capability. Uh, it's not uh, Webb is not in or, in low Earth orbit. There are important distinguishers that actually makes James Webb, which is not just a, a mere uh, successor, it's, it's, it's really the next generation of space telescope. So talking about its location, it's one of the key characteristics in James Webb. It's an impressive 1.5 million kilometers or 1 million miles away from the Earth. It's in a locally stable point, which is called a Lagrange point. There's, a, there's five of those around the, the Earth-Sun system. Uh, the one that's chosen is shown here, and it's it's, it's the one that essentially get, uh, and we'll see the benefits from that. Um, so so uh, Webb is, does not sit on L2. It actually orbits L2, and it's a typical hang around spot for uh, infrared telescopes. Uh, why is that so? It's because they all need to operate at low temperatures. In the case of Webb, it's below 50K. And it requires shielding from both the sun and also shielding from the earth all at once. Uh, it's noted that uh, the injection orbit, uh, that is the launch, was so successful uh, that it still has a significant fuel reserve, fuel reserve and uh, it allows essentially for a duration of emission that's going to go well beyond the 10 years nominal operation. So the full generation of uh, astronomers will can now plan to, to use the data from web. So. We'll take a look at a short video. Hopefully it's gonna work. If the lag is too big, uh, you may not be able to see it. But uh, so let's see if the video gets started. It doesn't. Anyway, so uh, as I said, you know, the orbit of L2, so it orbits around the circle. And uh, what's important is that the sun shield, uh, which is made of, uh, it's a tennis court size sun shield. It's quite impressive. It's constituted of five very thin, almost air thin layers. Uh, that always essentially shields web from both the sunshine, which is a bit obvious, but also from the earth shine. So in the infrared, it's important to shield it also from the earth radiation. And that's precisely what this orbit is intended to do. Okay, so a quick look at the instrument. Uh, they're quite complex. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but it's a formidable observatory. It's composed of four primary science instrument or instrument assembly. So near CAM is James Webb primary imager. Uh, it consists of, uh, it covers essentially from the visible to 0.6 to 5 micron. There's two nearly identical fully redundant modules. Uh, they point to adjacent field of view in the sky and can be used simultaneously. Uh, they split the light in some complex way, uh, allowing essentially simultaneous imaging at two different wavelengths. Uh, it's quite complex. There's a wide field range, there's an aerial field range, there's broad filters, etc. It operates in with a slit, without a slit, essentially very complex instrument. Uh, let's take a look now at the, an instrument developed through a collaboration between the uh, European Consortium and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, that is the mid-infrared instrument, that's MIRI. Uh, it provides coverage in a mid infrared wavelength that is much longer ones, and imaging can be obtained through nine broadband filters. Uh, it also has a spectroscopic mode, which allows at low spectral resolution, though, but uh, uh, provides uh, also a slit and a non slit uh, capacity of imaging. Uh, then the third instrument, which is non Canadian, I'll, I'll move to the Canadian instruments afterwards, but is the uh, near infrared spectrograph 
very versatile spectroscopic instrument. So it breaks the light into multiple uh, wavelengths and operates in the visible 0.6 to 5.3 microns. Uh, it has a very high throughput. That's a very efficiency, uh, especially for single object spectroscopy, but it uses fixed slits. Uh, again, it's a very complex instrument with many, many modes uh, to be looking. It was built in collaboration with uh, Airbus Industry and also uh, Detector Success then by NASA. So these are the, uh, the three uh, international instruments. Uh, let's now take a look at the Canadian contribution. So we've, again, it's not out of a vacuum. We built on our past success. Uh, Canada, it may not be known, but Canada provided the fine error sensor and the fuse mission back in 1999 and demonstrated then its capacity to deliver a key instrument to James Webb. Also, early Canadian scientists were involved in a then name. It was called the Next Generation Space Telescope, not yet Webb, uh, such as Professor Sim Simon Lilly of the University of Toronto, uh, which is to this day still a member of the science working group. Uh, and also people like John Hutchings, which is a, was, uh, became the FGS instrument PI. Uh, they were able to convince NASA to let Canada deliver this critical component. Uh, also, there was a D-scope, so that's, that's the FGS. We'll take a look again in more detail. And, and also there was a D-scope of what was then a fabri perot tunable filter interferometer that, that the US wanted to do, but they actually d -scope. And some Canadian scientists uh, seized the opportunity, uh, René Wayne, namely, to raise to the challenge to use the mass and volume margin that, that was now made available by the d instrument uh, to propose a Canadian science instrument. They worked really hard and the concept evolved over time, actually now, now deriving to the nearest concept. So it's only in 1996 uh, that the international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the CSA finally materialized. So um, they are functionally independent, that is the FGS and the NIRIS, we'll take a look, but they were packaged as a single unit. Uh, their combined dimension is roughly, as you see, a cubic meter, uh, essentially a dishwasher size with a mass of about 80 kilogram. Might be a very expensive and complex dishwasher. Uh, the finds guidance sensor is a critical component of the proper functioning of James Webb as a whole. So for me, it's amazing that even NASA let us do such thing that's on the critical, critical path. Every single observation that's being performed on James Webb need the help and the support of the finds guidance sensor. So um, the primary purpose was to ensure pointing stability, but you can break it down into three areas. So number one, provide a whole field image to help find the area of the skies that need to be targeted. That is to determine the, the position of the spacecraft in space. Element number two, serve to identify the targeted area using a catalog guide star. So it focuses on a guide star once identified, then it helps maintain the guide star in a very tight portion of the sky. So it locates and track a celestial target. Element number three, it provides the satellite attitude control system with precise information to maintain the pointing accuracy, again, the one millisecond arc second, but 16 times per second doing so. It, so it remains steadily with very high precision on a specific target. So uh, FGS is again, a fairly not so complex, but an instrument with a primary mirror, three mirror assembly to collimate the light. Uh, for those that know the, uh, the detector or are interested by this, it's a Mercury Canyon Telluride detector. It's about four megapixels, uh, also closely divisible to near infrared range. It was built by Honeywell Canada, which was formerly known as Condé. Uh, now moving to the science instrument, which is the nearest, so uh, the near infrared imager and slitlet spectrograph. It provides unique observation capability between, again, 0.6 and 5 micron that complements DOT available with the previous instrument, the near cam in NSPEC. It's a very high efficiently uh, all reflective design. There's no, uh, there's only mirror surfaces. There, there's no lenses. It's, it's uh, provide a wide field imaging, a spectroscopic. So it's a very complex instrument with multiple modes of operation using state-of-the-art grating prism combined or so-called grisms for spectroscopy, either at low resolution over a wide field, it's as much as two uh, arc minutes uh, by two arc minutes, to a medium resolution grism spectroscopy, which is optimized for application requiring extreme spectroscopic stability. Uh, it also has a set of filter that allows it to match those of near cam. So again, it's a four megapixel uh, camera with a Mercury Canyon Telluride detector. So what was shown on the right is, is one of the things you can deliver with the system because of its precision 
It, it enables measurement of the relative brightness of the solar occultation. In this case, it's the WASP 9796 uh, BB is, I think, is the star, uh, the, the planet in WASP 96 is the star, allows to reveal the present in this case of what is a hot giant, a gas giant exoplanet that's orbiting the star. So NERIS was a contribution of, well, of course, the CSA, but also uh, Honeywell International. It was also uh, led by René Doyon, University of Montréal, with uh, also technical support from the National Research Council. So why doing this? Uh, obviously, there's some industrial benefits, but uh, most important, in my opinion, is the, uh, the, the system is now functionally functioning, fully operating. But uh, it enables uh, these technological contributions enable the Kenyan astronomers to gain access to the amazing science that will be delivered by Well. So there's a variety of access that's being given. There's a, the only non-competent one is the guaranteed time observation, which is giving to the scientists that help develop the primary instrument. So Canada gets two times 200 hours to this program. Uh, also, Canadians have been fairly successful in competing in the case of the early release science. So that's not the early release obser uh, observing observations, it's the early release sciences, with one Canadian co-PI being selected, but other Canadian collaborators having been selected. What's critical is the success that Canadians have had in the general observer programs or the GEO program. This was the first call, and you see that 14 Canadian-led proposals have been selected. And more than 70 Canadian researchers are actually collaborating on this. Overall, it's 5% of all of the web observing time that's on average will be dedicated to Canada for its contribution. It, it may sound as a low number, but it, if, if you make the fraction of how much we invested to uh, actually how much the whole system costed, it's very efficient. Okay, now we're moving to the science. Uh, and some of the science objective. This one is on the early universe. So it's an amazing science that's, that's unveiled because, well, James Webb is such a formidable time machine with unprecedented light collecting capacity and also the capacity to look very distant in the early universe. Uh, it's like it's the, the, the part of the reason James Webb was designed to observe in the infrared uh, is explained by the, uh, essentially by the redshift that we are observing uh, in the light. That is, the light is being emitted by distant stars and galaxy, and because of the expansion of the universe, uh, essentially the expansion expands the light also as it reaches us. Wavelength shifts then from the visible light if they were emitted then to the, to the, to the infrared lights as we see it. So ultimately, James Webb is, is tailor-made for it to be a time machine allowing to uh, purse and look into the early universe. Uh, what I'm going to show next is uh, one of the early release observations that demonstrate this capacity with a deep field that most of you might have seen the image already. This is a, this is a, ma a massive galaxy cluster. Uh, it's, you got the number identified there. Uh, and it's so massive and, and, and the location it has, it, it acts as a strong gravitational lens that is it bends the light that's coming further from it. And, and essentially bends the lights toward us. It, it, it kind of acts as a magnifying uh, glasses allowing to see very distinctly in the background. <laughs> Uh, so that was already identified in previous surveys, for example, through Hubble. Uh, but what you see in there is just amazing depth of the field, the curvature of the gravitational lens. Uh, it's just it's just a beautiful into its image into itself. Uh, there's a lot of spectroscopy that can be done with this image and, and a lot of information that can be inferred. Uh, Okay, another element of the science objective is, is galactic evolutions. So it's an important science objective. It's to study how they evolve. And, and now the matter in the universe essentially is organized on the large scales. Uh, it helps to understand the nature and the history of the universe. Uh, we need to study so that we understand how, how matter organized and how it changed over a long period of time at different scales. A question can include, you know, how and when did the first galaxy form? Uh, how did we end up with the large variety of galaxies that we see today? Uh, also implies that we need a better understanding of the galactic structures and uh, the impact of uh, what massive black holes that many of the galaxies have in their center. Uh, galaxies are still merging and forming to, as we speak to this day. For example, our own local galactic neighborhood with the Andromeda galaxy, which is heading towards our own Milky Way. Um, of course, you know, it's not to worry that impact is only billions of years from, on, from now. So uh, what I've shown here also is another early release observation. It's the Stephens Quintet, so-called, because there's five galaxies, uh, NGC 
the 318 has two of them that are essentially merging. Uh, a large collection of massive galaxies. One is was is merging. Another one, NGC 7319, has a very active galactic nucleus, uh, rotating uh, also jet of gas that, uh, that emits a lot of radio uh, radio uh, wavelengths. Uh, it's a very complex environment that that really well demonstrates the ability of web uh, to be able to to look and to image uh, galactic mergers. Uh, just to notice that the seventy three twenty uh, that is the one on the side is much much closer to us. It just coincidentally happens to be in the field of view, but it's not actually merging to the other galaxies. Uh, third uh, science objective is stellar life cycle. Uh, you know, st uh, stellar astronomy has been there for a long time. It's it's quite interesting, but uh, uh, understanding stellar birth and the early evolution of stars uh, is is much newer. Uh, that telescope used to uh, to peer deep into the dense and dust rich environments uh, need to be able to observe in uh, in non traditional wavelengths. The the, the uh, visible light is. Uh, is essentially the dust is essentially opaque to the visible light. And, and, and infrared as a capacity is not as diffracted as capacity to, to penetrate much deeper. Uh, so young star formation, uh, such as this uh, Carina Nebula, uh, has very complex interactions between the stars and the interstellar medium. Uh, the details of how the star evolve and how they release some heavy elements that then get recycled into new stars that also get, get, get born uh, is a very complex environment. Uh, this is an early release uh, image again uh, of the Carina Nebula. Uh, it shows what's called the eastern edge. It's rotated. My, my, there's no up and down in, in space, but this is rotated. Typically, you would see that to the east. Uh, it's the eastern edge of a much larger ionized bubble, but it's, it's, it's a great zoom. If you've seen the comparison to Hubble, this is much clearer, much nicer uh, view of the same image being taken now by Webb. Uh, it's a highly ionizing region, so many of the star emits radiation. Uh, some of the gas gets uh, essentially ionized; they lose their electrons. They're, they're, they're essentially more transparent to light. And, and in some areas, well, you see the dust rich as being pushed. And in those areas of dust rich uh, element, uh, maybe I should use the pointer dust rich element in here. But you see many stars being forming uh, at the same time. So it's a pretty good understanding of star forming. Uh, and it really helps for the, the understanding of stellar evolutions. Okay, that brings us to the last but not least, certainly not least, uh, science objective of Webb, which in my opinion is one of the most exciting objective, which is the quest for exoplanets. Uh, since the first was observed, we now have thousands of those in, 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 in our, uh, that have been uh, observed uh, and every sorts of star systems that have, have been listed so far. Uh, this continue to expand every day. So it's one of the main use of the James Webb telescope is to be able to study the atmospheres of those exoplanets. So that's that's not as, as common. To search for the building block of life, potentially, if we're lucky, uh, elsewhere in the universe. So uh, primary method by which it's going to observe this, it's, it's the transit method. I've shown you some image of the nearest instrument with the transit method. So essentially, the planet orbits around the star. Uh, the starlight gets dimmer. And essentially, by characterizing the, 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 the difference in the imagery with and without the planet, you can infer some elements having to do with the composition of the exoplanet atmosphere. Uh, what, uh, so it's a primary method. Uh, it requires a pretty good, essentially, dimming of the star itself. So uh, some method they use uh, uh, called coronography that enables direct imaging of an exoplanet. This is what we see here. Uh, it's not uh, one of the early release. It's a very recent release. Uh, it's the first exoplanet image by Webb. Uh, it's HIP 65426 for those that know. Uh, it's planet B. It's about seven times the mass of Jupiter. It's very far from, from, from its sun. Uh, and it's a very young planet also, millions of years and not billions of years, if I understand correctly. So uh, very interesting. So, so these are actually you know, the image of an exoplanet, just uh, incredible. Uh, then uh, finally, it's also important to understand that, that yes, other worlds also mean studying the, uh, our own solar system. Uh, obviously, there are ground-based, other telescopes. Uh, there's, all, there's even uh, 
there's even uh, missions that are being sent to those distant worlds in our solar system. But, but data with a different wavelength uh, and also from different sources and, and an amazing resolution that allows us to, to, to build a broader, fuller picture of the objects in our own solar system. Uh, this is such an impressive image of Jupiter, where you see the auroras, you see the, the, the rings, you see uh, diffraction spikes from even some of the planets or uh, of the of the moons orbiting Jupiter. Uh, I just I think I'm speechless to see this this amazing image. Hopefully you have appreciated as much as I did. So we're getting to the end of the talk. Uh, I'm just going to cover um, a bit more. Uh, obviously, Webb is amazing. As I said, it's our flagship, but it's not our only space telescope. Uh, currently, we have uh, contributions, uh, not necessarily leadership, but contributions. For example, on top right, uh, it's the AstroSat, which is India's first astronomy satellite dedicated to studying hot high energy objects in the universe, like young stars and black holes. So we did contribute uh, detectors to this, uh, to this mission, to a detector that's ultraviolet imaging telescope. It's called UVIT. And uh, thanks to the contribution to this science instrument, uh, we now have ability to compete for observing time on AstroSat. And we do that. We have calls uh, systematically where we get Canadian scientists that can observe, they can access uh, the multiple wavelength from the observatory. There's X-ray, visible light, et cetera. Uh, the main mission was to observe high energy activities in star system, et cetera. It's, it's a, again, fairly complex uh, set of, of capacity. Uh, then we can move to, uh, it's not, it's not uh, the involvement of the CSA is not so large in this one, but it's an uh, impressive industry uh, and, and academia base uh, system, which is the bright constellation on the top left. Uh, it's the first space astronomy missions to be carried with nanosats. Uh, it's still in operation to this day. I remind you, it's been launched in 2013. Not all the satellites function. There were six initially. Uh, only a few now remains. But uh, it had the goal to uh, uh, learn more about the structure and evolution of the brightest stars. So obviously, the light collecting capacity is not that great. But for the brightest stars, they could, they could uh, look at, for example, precursors to supernova explosion. Uh, Canada was more than a partner in Bright, actually. Uh, they partner also with Austria and Poland. And, and, and we did provide support for both the, uh, the design build and then the operations uh, of the systems to this day. Uh, finally, the TRIO is completed. And uh, this one is only Canadian. It's, it's called the NEOSAT. Uh, uh, it's the world's first space telescope dedicated to detecting and tracking asteroids, comets, and satellites, and space debris. So it's kind of a suitcase-sized satellite that can really look very closely to the sun. So you see there's a fairly long baffle at the front of it. And that allows it to look uh, more close to the sun than many other systems. So NEOSAP sweeps the sky, uh, observing satellites, space debris, and it's part of our Canada's commitment to keeping space environments safe. Uh, can also reveal the presence of exoplanet, and it's the astronomical link here, uh, around distant stars, again, using a principle of uh, looking at the light intercity variation around stars uh, that are due to uh, orbiting exoplanets. So most uh, NeoSat and Bright also were building on the most uh, successful earlier, now the commission most instrument. And uh, this is my last slide. So I'm completing my talk on this. It's, it's of course, we have to look to the future. So what is it? We've talked about web. It's going to operate for a long time, but let's take a look at the future. And one of the highest priority that the CASCA, the Kenyan Astronomical Society, have, have proposed in the long range plans is the CASTA. It's called the Cosmological Advanced Survey Telescope for optical and ultraviolet research or CASTA. It's a proposed mission concept that would image the skies, obviously in the ultraviolet as a blue optic and blue optical wavelengths. In a certain sense, it can be felt as an actual successor to Hubble. Uh, it's developed in collaboration with NRC CASTA, would be operating close to the diffraction limit. It's a one meter size aperture telescope, so much smaller than Hubble, but the, the developing technology and detector capacity uh, makes it still uh, they would cover a much larger field of view, about 100 times larger than Hubble can actually do. Uh, if funded, CASTA would be the very first Canadian-led large space astronomy mission. Uh, currently, it's, uh, there's both a feasibility study and technology development that are being supported by the CSA at this time. Also identified in the long-range plan, Canada is positioned to maintain its world leadership in studies of cosmic microwave background. So the CMB, uh, there's substantial participation in either or both uh, the CMB S4, which is a ground-based facility. And, and what is shown here is the JAXA, that is the uh, Japanese, Japanese Space Agency-led light mission in space. space. 
uh, they target so the cosmic microwave background in a very complex way. I think I'm, 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 even try to get to explain, uh, we'd be out of my depth here, but it, it allows to fully exploit the relic radiation uh, from the from the uh, from the uh, the Big Bang, yet to understand the origin and the history of the current universe. So uh, there's a kick and in uh, technology at the art of Lightbird, uh, which has uh, also potential spin off for uh, quantum computing. Even we support again technology and concept studies from this area. And last but uh, much smaller is the uh, Ariel. It's it's a fairly large mission. It's an approved uh, me uh, medium class uh, Earth, uh, European Space Agency mission. Uh, again, a one meter telescope, but it's designed to obtain precise transmission spectroscopy for a large number of transiting exoplanets. So uh, Canada would not necessarily contribute a significant portion of it, but we are uh, considering a, a small contribution that would enable Canadian scientists to be part of the Ariel Consortium and have priority access to the data. These are not the only concepts we're looking into for the future. There are some other listed down below. Uh, they cover a large variety of observatory type and their observatory size. Uh, none of these concepts have been secure yet, but they're being fostered because what we want is to ensure that Canada can continue to strive for a bright future in space astronomy. So with that, I think I'm on time and uh, hopefully I uh, stirred some interest uh, and uh, we'll be gladly taking some questions to the extent that I can answer them. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, we're seeing if we'll get a little bit of uh, audio. I'm not sure if you can hear me here. Ed, go ahead. Oh, yes, Yeah, very well. Hopefully uh, it wasn't so bad at my end too uh, when I spoke, so. Yes, but I, I'd love to be able to show the video because it's such a great, uh, let me try again to share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna do this because the video is, is such much better than I could even try to uh, to show you the exact orbit. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very stable orbit, mind you. Uh, so will it stop? Will it, of course it's a work, but I tried it at home. No, it's not. Give me a second. I think it's worth it. 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 Maybe, Maybe I won't succeed in trying to hard. Something, something too complicated. Oh, okay. there we go. So, so you see where web orbits are around L2 uh, in, in a circular orbit. orbit. Uh, it's, it's a fairly stable orbit, orbit because it's, it's around L2 and, and there's a compensation of both the orbital mechanics and the gravity of the Earth and the Sun combined. So, so it doesn't require a lot of, uh, of, of well to maintain. What's really interesting, and I'll start it again so you can see it again is that, that this really enables the sun shield to be always pointing more or less towards the earth and the sun. So it serves to baffle both of those. So, uh, if, if the question was asking me, what is the orbital mechanics that allowed this to happen, I just, I just don't have the answer to that. Uh, but this video shows a pretty well a complex orbit. First, it, it orbits over the full year. And of course, where you cannot observe everywhere at any time. It has a specific observation locations depending on when it is in the, in the yearly cycle and its geometry to the Earth, the Sun, and the rest of the universe. Okay, great. Um, and there is another question here about uh, the image of Jupiter. Um, and there was something labeled uh, Io's footprint. And the question was, what is Io's footprint? 
<laughs> if, 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 oh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay I'll, I'll show, show it again. again. Uh, again I'll, I'll share, share, share the screen. screen. Uh, let me let me go back to presentation mode. Uh, just a second. Yes, it's, it's such, such a great, great picture. picture. Let's, let's, let's take a look again. again. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully, I know the answer. But uh, share mode. Okay. And sure. Sure. Okay. okay. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good question for the IS footprint. footprint. Uh, uh, I certainly understand, I understand the spike here, the diffraction spike, because I is, is, is out of the picture. Uh, uh, so, so, so it's, it's not, not to be seen here. here. Uh, but, but that's, that's a good question. question. I, 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 admit, I, I, I don't, don't know why. It's a good one. Can I take a range? It must be maybe the shadow. Whoops. Oh, oh yes, yeah, that's that's must be it. Yeah, I, somebody's it's listening good. online back exactly, there. Exactly, exactly. It's got to be the that that's the point. If the footprint, it must be the shadow. Yeah. But, but I admit that it's barely visible. visible. It's, uh, uh, I would have to zoom. I, I think I see, I see it at my screen. screen. There's no way you can see the yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah but, but that, that's, that's what, what it must be. If there are any questions on the Hi, Does anybody in the room here have questions for? I have a question. This is really naive, but why a slitless spectrograph? Okay, okay so, 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 yeah, yeah there's, there's many ways to, to split it a lot. Okay, okay. And, uh, and, uh, there's, there's many, many, many ways. ways. Of course, the, 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 the most ancient one is the, the, the Newton's way, where you use a prism. prism. So, you use a prism, prism, prism and different diffraction indexes that are on the, on the wavelength of the light. It, light gets curved differently as it enters the prism and it, it separates. White light enters in and you get a different set of lights going out. Uh, many of the spectroscopic spectrometers uh, have been using a, a meta essentially, which is a, it's called a diffraction grading. So, the light gets separated. And the light gets separated. Uh, to use that, you need a slit. So, so otherwise your your image gets blurred. So the, essentially, the slit allows to remove the uh, un unwanted light on your detector. So in one dimension you have the, the wavelength, in the other dimension you have the image. You have to construct the image. In the case of, uh, of the nearest, it doesn't need to be slit. Uh, which is the next generation system, system. and there's, there's many, many ways, ways to do this. Uh, uh, there's uh, even uh, interferometers uh, use other ways also, but, but, but in their, their case, they use a combination of a prism and a grid, uh, which is called a prism. So, so uh, essentially, uh, light gets separated, and, and they don't need a uh, Maybe my explanation is pretty not so good, but we need a diagram to, to give a better explanation. But, but uh, that's the best idea. Yeah, we have, we have some more online questions here, Martin. Um, let's see, uh, Ron McNaughton asks, um, uh, the, the total web cost was way over its initial budget. Did Canada have to pay part of those extra costs or did we do what uh, we budgeted for? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great, great question, question China. China. Uh, <laughs> I can carry more, more to the more aspects, aspects of the way that it's technology over science. But uh, no, indeed, what, what was uh, the, the idea of a national, national contribution to a space program? Is Canada commits to delivering this, and, and sometimes, sometimes what it would cost. So, so it depends on the arrangement. arrangement. Uh, in, in the case, case of uh, near the yes, yes, once we committed to deliver on those, and which we did, yes, there was some overruns even in Canada, but nowhere near the significant overruns that we saw for changes. So, so, so uh, in the, the end, end, ultimately, uh, things, things that, that drive the uh, uh, cost overruns is, is the duration of time. Where has it been launched and postponed and postponed and postponed? Postpone postpone postpone. postpone. So, we, we have, have to hit some of the extra cost due to that, but, but not, not in the ratio of cost increase that we saw for web and So, uh, I don't know. If you, you make, make a calculation, we expend it to roughly on a program that's now way above 10 billion more. So I think, uh, getting 5% of observing time, time for such, such a small contribution is very significant. It's not to the initial ratio. I think we did, we did better. We did better, better managing the budget. I have a bunch of online questions, but if you want to, if, if there are other room questions. Any other questions in the room here before we go to online? Okay. Uh, Graham W. asks, is L2 the first time this has been used in space exploration? 
No, no, not at all. all. It's, 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 it's getting busy. Uh, 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 there's, there's a, a WMAP map that, that was there. there. Uh, there's there's plant still, still there. there. Uh, 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 it's, it's a, a really, really sweet spot, spot for uh, infrared, infrared observatory. observatory. For the, the same, same reason, reason for web. It allows to shield the Earth and, and, and the Sun. It's also stable. Orbital mechanics is also stable. It's not so bad for dust, maybe, but not so bad in the Sun. Uh, we have experienced uh, some first issue with the micro terabytes. Uh, it's, it's part of the challenge of being out there in space, unprotected by the Earth's uh, radiation shield, uh, which, which you get in the orbit. Uh, but the orbit is, is much better. And that's actually the next question. Randy Atwood from Mississauga asked um, if you could provide in any information on the micrometeoroid danger and how the one hit has affected its performance. Not, not much. much. Uh, yeah, I, 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 can I can tell you that it has not, not affected much its performance. I saw some uh, not directly uh, but some engineers working with us. I saw some of the results. results and, 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 and actually, actually at this point, point it's, it's not concerning at all. Uh, the, the question, question is, is do we understand the statistics of micrometeorite impact at that location with respect to size and frequency of micrometeorites? And that's what's not as well. So is this a one in wonder Something that, that happens will not necessarily repeat itself, itself so far, so good. And, and no, it has not significantly injured the spacecraft. Uh, uh, it would be options if it comes to that point of steering maybe the spacecraft in some other direction, but it's not necessarily it's the mitigation that's in case the problem is uh, Michelle? Yeah, I'd love to know what the sky coverage is of the James Webb telescope that varies over the year. Sky coverage means uh, over its lifetime, or you mean the field of view? Like the full sphere, the celestial sphere. Yeah, I'm having a hard time to see the Oh, sorry. I can I can repeat the question. Um, so, how much of the of the, of the celestial sphere can the telescope um, image essentially, and uh, does that vary throughout the year? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. does. As, As you saw with the orbital mechanics, mechanics, of course, of course it's, 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 it's always in, uh, pointing, pointing away, away from the Earth-Sun uh, ray. ray. So, so, so uh, essentially, it's always pointing away. Of course, course it, it can look into that half hemisphere from the well, well and perhaps even beyond some of it. it. Uh, but, but because it's, it's always pointing in this way, it's, it's, it's not pointing in all directions all at once. So, it does vary throughout the year, its ability to image portions of the sky. Okay, uh, we have a couple more online questions. Um, Robert Rorat asks, how many stars can be analyzed, processed at the same time for the existence of exoplanets? That, that's, 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 that's a good cool question. question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. that. Uh, finding, finding an exoplanet, exoplanet is much more difficult than, than, than characterizing it, it in, in a sense. sense once, once you know, you know where, where it is, is. to find an exoplanet, exoplanet, you have to happen to be witnessing the, the transit. transit. And, and, and for that, that you have to guess, guess where's the visit, where it is. is. Some other missions might be a bit better to, to, to find uh, exoplanets. But, but once, once you've found, found them, knowing when, when the transit will be, then you can target where you, you can, can image it, and then you can look at its atmosphere. So that's where it's quite powerful. Uh, there are statistical methods to look at the data to find them by chance, but it's not the most efficient method. Well, time is going to be very precious. So when you, you bid and you say, I want to observe this, it's not going to be uh, looking for a chance event. It's going to be, you need to know the science, you need to know that the, this, orbit, uh, this planet is going to transit and, and you want to characterize it, you have good reasons for it. So I think that's going to drive the, what actually where you can, can look at. It. Judy? Access. So uh, there's the uh, there's the SCS uh, yeah, so the, uh, there's a science telescope institute which is located in Baltimore which has got the responsibility for NASA to both operate and to uh, to essentially the science operations center. Um, most of the data will be stored. I, I don't know physically if the cloud service is done, but, but but essentially they're they're carrying to most of that. In in Canada, the National Research uh, uh, Center, the Edinburgh Institute, has a Canadian 
uh, astronomical data center, uh, which is dedicated to, to capture the data and the observations that, that we will have with web uh, to make sure that we start with the, the, the Canadian uh, portion of the data that we receive. Uh, there, there are all the other repositories also, secondary repositories are a bit all over the place. Uh, for example, some of the nearest team and FGS team may, may get access to some of the data for their own purpose. Okay, and we have one more online question here. Uh, Ed Radfer asks, uh, what happens to web and other L2 satellites when they are decommissioned? I think they stay there. Uh, they stay there for as long as, as, as they, they stay there. It's not that stable. So ultimately, they wander away. So, so I don't know how long it takes, but ultimately, they, they, they don't stay there. It, it actually takes some effort to stay in L2. So. Uh, it's, it's not, not as stable, stable as some, as some of the other electronic like points where, where this may be an issue. But L2 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 I don't know if it's, if it's years, tens of years. I, I, don't know. I know for low Earth orbit because that's recommended by a lot of systems in low Earth orbit. We need to go to the commission and then within might be 25 years or something. That's all. But there's the Earth atmosphere that, that helps to go there now and essentially come back and burn and re entry. Uh, for L2, it's just, there's nothing like this. It's, it's out there. Stays there. I admit I don't know if they're going to take a fuel reserve to bring it back, but I doubt it, sincerely. Okay. Hi, Mark. Ken, uh, Ted right here. Um, I have a question. Uh, it's kind of an engineering question. I was wondering about the uh, fine guidance sensor, I think is what you called it. Um, so, what I would understand is that that actually helps guide it to where it's trying to point to uh, target a particular object. How does the telescope move? Like, does some corner of the telescope move, or does the whole telescope move, or does the whole vehicle move? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's not, not a steer telescope, uh, a gimbal in a way that you would have a sitting on, on a, a ground base of the retrograde. It's, 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 it's the whole spacecraft that, that has to move. So, so it's the gyroscopes uh, that allow us to, uh, to, to, to steer it to slow it down, gently essentially keep it in position. So the FGS provides the information that the whole platform need to use to stay locked in, in the pointing position. That, that's, how, that's how it works, essentially. Are there any other questions? It's, it's general oh, we, have, we have one more quick question. Can an individual get time on the James Webb telescope? <laughs> everyone is, it's open for everyone to bid. Uh, I'm not sure you're not going to get funded. You can fund at least to get you can Space Agency financial support, if you get observing time, you need to be associated with an uh, academic institution. So that's one of the definitions. Could be a student, could be, a, of course, a professor or uh, To get observing time, uh, what you need is, is a good proposal. So uh, I, I did not submit, so I don't know for sure. But, but if you have a good proposal, you have a good proposal. It's, it's a, a double-blind peer review. That is, no one knows who submits. No one knows the name, no one knows when if it's a, it's a man or woman, it's, it's double line. It's, it's, it's essentially they look at the text, and if you have a great text and a good idea, and uh, the, the community that evaluates the things, it's the thing to do with the precious hours of the web, they, they, you get time. Now, now what you do and what you do with the imagery after that, what software you use, etc. But uh, we got surprisingly in this call. Uh, because of the double line procedure, we got a fairly high number of postdoctoral students. And even post and even PhDs that, that got time in web. So, uh, uh, typically, we almost get no one to get time at that those level of tuition. Uh, but in case of web, it is a little blind. We, we got new entrants into the field of astronomy that were able to have pretty good uh, pitch and get selected. Okay. No, that's it. Wrap. So, Martin, just on behalf of the RASC Winnipeg Center and the RASC Mississauga Center, we just want to say thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation and, uh, on Canada's contributions and where the science going with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And again, thank you very much on behalf of everybody. And I just want to say to a few other people, uh, thank you for tonight, um, Ed and Scott here at Winnipeg Center, we've worked hard together to put this together, and then Randy uh, Atwood at the Mississauga Center as well. 
So if everyone could just, you know, as best you can, please a round of applause to all those people. And again there, uh, thank you very much, uh, Aunt Martin, and we uh, wish you all the best in your role at the CSA. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be signing